Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Megan Barra. I am a clinical pharmacy specialist in the neurocritical care unit at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, I was invited here today to talk to you guys a little bit about um, my job as a clinical pharmacist in the neuro ICU and also kind of introduce to you pharmacy as a career um, and kind of what it means to be a pharmacist. Um, you know, before I went into pharmacy school and went into clinical practice, uh, a lot of people said, you know, are you just counting pills on a counter? And their perception of a pharmacist is those who work at Target or CVS, uh, Rite Aid or Walgreens. Um, and these are really our community-based pharmacists, and they do a lot of work when it comes to medication dispensing, as well as patient counseling and immunization in the community. Um, but you know, as I hope you guys will come to learn throughout this presentation is that there's a lot of other roles for pharmacists. Um, and, you know, the community role is one of them, but there's also pharmacists who work in the hospital setting as well as um, the industry setting. So I'm going to talk to a little talk to you guys today a little bit about what I do um, in the healthcare system. Um, but to give you guys a little bit of background on what the education path is to be a pharmacist. So for pharmacists, it is a doctor of pharmacy degree. Um, how one becomes a pharmacist is that they either do two years of pre-pharmacy work followed by a four-year graduate program, um, or more commonly, a four-year undergraduate program followed by a four-year graduate program of professional um, pharmacy courses. Um, and similar to kind of medical school where you have to take the MCAT to get into medical school, you do have to take uh, the pharmacy college admissions test, otherwise known as the PCAT, to get into many uh, graduate pharmacy programs. And, um, you know, we do take undergraduate courses in chemistry, organic chemistry, uh, anatomy and physiology, biology, physics, microbiology, and biochemistry. So, um, you know, very similar to many of the healthcare professions undergraduate course requirements. Um, but once you actually get into pharmacy schools where you really focus in on, um, you know, what, it, what you need to know to be a successful pharmacist. And with that, we're focusing on, you know, pharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics. So, um, you know, how do medications interact with our body and our body systems, um, both in terms of metabolism, um, elimination, as well as any receptor interactions to have its effect. Um, we also learn a lot about therapeutics, pharmacy law, um, pharmacology, medicinal chemistry. Um, immunology is a big one when it comes to anti-infective medications, as well as some pharmacoeconomics. So, um, you know, the undergraduate courses are going to seem very similar between the different um, healthcare professions, but once you get into the graduate courses, uh, you know, you're really focused in on um, the interaction of medications on the body and treating diseases. And so, like I mentioned, there's a lot of different um, practice settings that pharmacists can go into. So the community one is the one that I think the, the society is most familiar with. Um, so these are going to be our pharmacists based in our community pharmacies, whether it be a chain pharmacy like CVS or Walgreens or one of your independent pharmacies. Um, you know, these pharmacists are going to be kind of the most accessible healthcare professional, um, and they're going to be a huge resource to the community when it comes to um, over-the-counter medication counseling, picking up prescriptions, um, new prescription counseling, and immunization. So, um, you know, they have a huge role in the community, but there's also another uh, couple different areas of pharmacy that you can go into. Um, you know, academia is another one. So those are the pharmacists who work in the university um, who do a lot of research, whether it be bench research or clinical research. Um, pharmaceutical industry is another huge uh, area for pharmacists. So a lot of pharmacists might um, do postgraduate training with fellowship and go into pharmaceutical industry, working on clinical trials, drug development, um, medication affairs, uh, as well as any, you know, education for pharmaceutical companies on how to use their products, um, you know, once they're FDA approved. Um, but me specifically, as well as many, as many, as well as many pharmacists um, do work in the health system. So this is pharmacists who work in the hospital setting, uh, long-term care facilities, um, or even the clinics and the ambulatory clinics. Um, and a lot of people don't actually know that pharmacists are very integrated into the hospital setting. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, even within my own family, are still trying to get a sense of what I, what I actually do for my job. Um, but to give you a sense of, you know, what a hospital pharmacy looks like and kind of the, the landscape of how many um, pharmacists work in a hospital. Um, so our department of pharmacy has about 350 full-time employees. And of those 350 full-time employees, there's about 100 clinical pharmacists within the department. Um, my practice area in particular is the neuro uh, intensive care unit. 
Um, and then we also have a general neurology ward that has a pharmacist and then a pharmacist that rotates between the two. So there's about three pharmacists who are neurology focused within those hundred. Um, but this is probably pretty similar amongst a lot of academic medical institutions. Um, and then as well as community pharmacists, uh, community hospitals also have clinical pharmacy specialists as well. Um, our pharmacy department manages a $368 million annual drug budget. Um, so there's a lot of medications that are going in and out, whether it be for inpatient care or the ambulatory care setting. Um, but there's over 9 million medication dispenses annually. Um, part of my job is doing medication order review and verification for all of the you know, medications for patients uh, assigned to my unit. And to give you a sense of you know, how many medications are being ordered, um, at our institution, there's over 200,000 medications being ordered per month. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of uh, medications that are going you know, in and out of the pharmacy um, and medications that are being used in patients. So thinking about 200,000 medications, those are gonna become really important when it comes to drug interactions and you know, patient-specific care. So um, you know, I think we, we are definitely present in the hospital um, and it's something that not many people really know about. Um, and a lot of people wonder, you know, what are we actually doing in the hospital? If you don't see, you know, if people don't really know what a pharmacist does, um, I think it's helpful to kind of get a sense of what, what value we add to patients. Um, so, you know, part of being a clinical pharmacist, um, meaning that you're assigned to a unit and you're covering a specific patient population. Um, in my case, I'm, I'm specifically covering patients with neurocritical care um, illnesses, such as status epilepticus and ischemic stroke and intracranial hemorrhage. Um, but you know, my job is really to evaluate the, both the appropriateness and the effectiveness of patients' medications. So um, you know, really looking at the medication, determining like, is this meeting the patient's goal? Is this the best drug for the indication that it's being prescribed? Is there any alteration in this patient's um, you know, organ function that might make these drugs interact differently in this patient as they would in a healthy patient population? Um, in addition, we do, uh, you know, keep an eye out for any untreated problems. So if, um, you know, a patient has a diagnosis and they're not actually receiving a medication that can help facilitate improved outcomes with that diagnosis, um, we try and identify those and bring up those problems with the team. Um, you know, we monitor medications um, effects on the patient. Um, you know, just because we started medication doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is going to stay on that medication or continue needing that medication. So it's important to kind of follow that patient's progress. Um, and a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is really consulting with the healthcare team um, in medication therapy selection. Um, I personally don't do as much counseling um, with patients on how to best take their medications, but there are occasions that do arise in the intensive care unit where um, you know, a patient might require a medication and they would like to be counseled on it. And in that setting, I do you know, interact with patients, but there are other pharmacists who are you know, fully dedicated to just counseling patients on, on how to take their medications in the clinics. Um, and you know, I think one of the misperceptions of pharmacy is, is that you know, we don't just love medications and want everyone to be on medications. Um, you know, me personally, I'm a huge advocate of non-pharmacological interventions. And, you know, how I approach my care of patients is that I really try and do dose minimization and medication optimization. So what is the least amount of medications a patient needs to achieve their goals um, for, their, for their care? Um, and how can we really minimize any side effects in polypharmacy? Uh, you know, every medication is going to be associated with side effects and our job as a pharmacist as well as a healthcare team is to really minimize any side effects that a patient might have with a medication um, to avoid them having any complications. We really want these medications to support them, um, you know, in treating their baseline disease states and improving their outcomes. So if we can do that with non-pharmacological measures, that's always, you know, the goal and that's always ideal. Um, but you can't always do that necessarily, but um, definitely encouraging non-pharmacological interventions. Um, and, you know, one of the things that um, I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize is that in order for a hospital to actually be accredited um, by the Joint Commission body, um, so that that is kind of the standard organization that goes around and accredits all the hospitals, um, making sure that they're up to standards of care. Um, and one of their standards is, is that a pharmacist has to review the appropriateness of all medication orders for, medic um, for, for medications to be dispensed in the hospital. So anytime a patient is admitted to the hospital for any duration of time, 
every single medication that gets ordered is intended to be reviewed by a pharmacist before it's administered. So, um, you know, if a physician orders an antibiotic, that's going to be reviewed by a pharmacist for appropriateness before it's actually administered to that patient. And the things that me, um, me as a pharmacist is looking at um, when I look through a medication order, um, I kind of go through this list. So, you know, does the patient have any allergies or potential sensitivities? So, um, you know, for example, if someone is allergic to penicillin, um, you know, for many um, infections, a penicillin or penicillin-like antimicrobial is going to be your first-line agent. But if you have an allergy, you might not be able to get that. And then the question comes up of, you know, what is the best second-line agent that we can use for this patient? Um, I also think a lot about the existing um, or potential interactions between medications ordered, um, as well as any food and medications the patient is currently taking. Uh, so working in the neuro um, intensive care unit, a lot of patients are going to be on anti-epileptic drugs. And a lot of these anti-epileptic drugs do impact metabolism of other medications. Um, and with that, we have to think about, you know, how do I need to change the dose of either my anti-epileptic drug, or do I need to change the dose of another medication that is interacting with this, with this anti-epileptic drug that I'm adding on? Um, and this is something that we assess you know, every single day with every single order on how, these, how new medications are going to be interacting with their current medications or their current uh, nutritional intake. Um, you know, the other thing that we think about with every single medication order is, you know, the appropriateness of the medication. So as a patient is hospitalized, you know, their indication for that medication may change as new information becomes available. And with that, they might need a different dose. So if someone's kidney function changes, their dose will need to change or their frequency of their medication will change. Maybe they go from taking it every eight hours to now they take it every 12 hours um, just because they're not clearing the medication as quickly. Um, as well as a route of admin administration. So many of our medications are going to be taken orally, um, but sometimes we do have medications that have to be given, uh, you know, through an IV, um, or if a patient can't take any, um, you know, medications by mouth, then they have to transition to IV formulation. So, um, you know, every day I look at the patient's medication list and kind of think about, you know, is this still the best medication for this patient today? Um, and if it is today, well, I rethink about that tomorrow um, and see, you know, is this still the best medication? Um, additionally, I look at any, um, you know, current or potential impact um, of laboratory values. So looking at how their organ functions are doing. So how are their kidneys doing? How are, um, you know, their liver doing? How is their heart doing? Um, you know, how are their electrolytes doing? And all of that is going to kind of play into how I choose a medication. Um, one of the things I really like about clinical pharmacy is that you have all of the information available to you. You have the patient's entire history. You have all their laboratory values. Um, you have so much information that you can really make an informed decision um, that is best for that patient. Um, you know, one of the challenges with other practice settings is you might not have all that information available. So, you know, a doctor might not send all of the laboratory values to a CVS or Walgreens pharmacy. So um, it's a little bit different of an assessment. So for me personally, I really like having all of those values available so I can really make decisions on, on the dose of that medication. Um, you know, the other thing we think about is therapeutic duplication, you know, making sure that someone isn't getting like two medications for the same indication when they only really need, need one medication. Um, and kind of streamlining how we give medications to patients, as well as looking at if there's any other contraindications that a patient has. Um, so having a pharmacist look at these different elements is vital for a hospital in order to be accredited. Um, and you know, not all hospitals are gonna have 24 seven pharmacies um, and pharmacists on staff. Uh, many of the inner city academic medical centers do, but some of the community hospitals might only have pharmacists available you know, during the day or during the evening. And in those settings, they still have to have a pharmacist who comes in and retrospectively reviews the orders. So ideally, we would look at these orders before they're ever administered to a patient. And we think about these things before it's ever administered to a patient. Um, but if you are in a community hospital that doesn't have this um, level of staffing yet, um, in those cases, you still have a pharmacist that comes in every single day and looks back at through each patient's medication profile to make sure everything is, um, you know, looks okay from, a, from that standpoint. Um, and kind of give you guys a sense of, you know, what does a medication order look like? So I kind of screenshotted here um, an uh, order that came through when I was staffing, um, you know, last night. 
is an antibiotic that comes through. You can see that this information um, that's included in the order, it gives me the dose, it gives me the route, um, the frequency, the duration, as well as some lab results that come in. Um, in addition to this, I do have access to the patient's medication profile so I can get a whole host of other information. Um, but at our institution and many institutions you know, around the country, the pharmacist you know, will see an order like this come through um, you know, where a provider orders a medication, they say, I want to give this medication to my patient. And I kind of look at it and make sure, you know, is this the best dose? Is the best frequency? You know, is there anything that might want us to change the plan? Um, or, you know, will I go through, verify the order and um, have that be administered to the patient? And it's a pretty complex process. So I've included this kind of timeline um, at the bottom here of what happens after a provider places an order. Um, so, you know, we go on multidisciplinary rounds as the, as the clinical pharmacist and during rounds you decide, you know, you want to start a medication. So then the provider will place an order. Um, that order will come through, um, through my computer and show up um, similar to the screenshot I have here. Um, and I'll take a look at that and then I'll determine whether or not to verify that as a clinical pharmacist on the floor. Um, and then there's kind of two pathways that that order can take. And one is that the medication um, you know, order will then be transmitted down to our central pharmacy, where a technician, a pharmacy technician will then pull the product, um, you know, scan any barcodes. Uh, maybe it's an IV product and a pharmacy technician has to compound it, um, at which point both of these products would be, um, you know, checked by another pharmacist to make sure it's the right patient and the right drug, who will then deliver it to the floor to get the, um, the patient uh, administer the drug. Now, on the other hand, we do keep a lot of medications on the floor. So sometimes um, it's already stocked on the floor. So in those cases, as soon as I verify a medication, um, a nurse can go in and take it you know, out of the medication cabinet and administer to the patient right then and there. Um, so you know, this is probably the um, you know, biggest part of my job as a clinical pharmacist is to verify orders for clinical appropriateness. Um, there are different models throughout the country on um, you know, how much order verification a pharmacist does versus how much um, non-order verification a pharmacist does. And, um, you know, one of them is considered a hybrid model where the pharmacist looks at the orders and, you know, does all of the clinical care rounding on the patients. And then there's another model where you have a specific pharmacist who's rounding with the team, um, you know, performing teaching clinical care. And then you have another pharmacist who is looking at the orders and verifying. So it's a little bit different based off of where you are in the country. Um, at my institution, I kind of do everything, um, which I personally like um, because, you know, if you're there having the conversation with the team about what medication to order, um, you know, you really should be also the one who's like verifying that order because um, you can make sure that it aligns with the conversations that have been happening. Um, so as I've kind of alluded to, I do go on rounds every single day um, when I'm staffing in the neuro ICU. Um, and, you know, I think with the rounding team, um, just to kind of give you guys a little bit of um, insight into who's on that team. So every single day, about 830 in the morning, um, I meet with the team and we'll round bedside by um, bedside on each individual patient on our team. And um, the person who's kind of on, on that team is rounding um, for about, you know, anywhere from two hours to four hours, depending on how many patients are admitted, um, will usually consist of the attending physician. And um, we'll have a neurocritical care fellow, a neurology or neurosurgery resident. Um, we'll have an advanced practice provider. We'll have myself um, and the registered nurse who is taking care of the patient. And really on these, on these multidisciplinary rounds, um, that's where we kind of go over, um, you know, what's, what's currently going on with the patient. Um, what were the overnight events? What are their lab values? What are their imaging? What medications are they on? What's the plan for the day? And how do we implement that plan? Um, so, you know, the whole team is there deciding on what's the best course of action for this patient today to try and get them, you know, closer to that goal of being discharged home and being able to start their recovery from their hospital admission. Um, in addition to, to the team, um, we also have a whole host of other, um, you know, vital healthcare providers, including uh, respiratory therapists that help and make sure that, um, you know, patients breathing um, is appropriate, especially if they're requiring mechanical ventilation, 
Um, we have dietitians that make sure that patients are getting the appropriate nutrition, um, especially unique to each of their disease states. So, um, you know, patients with different disease states will have different nutritional needs. So we'll have someone who's looking at that. Um, you know, we'll have social workers um, who work with families as well as working with patients to make sure that they have access to care and the support that they need both in the hospital as well as once they're discharged. And many more consult services will also come in um, and, you know, provide any advice or consultation depending on the patient's needs. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the questions I was asked to prepare is, you know, what does a day um, look like for me as the neurocritical care pharmacist? Um, so, you know, from 8.30 until either 11.30 or 12.30, I'll typically participate in multidisciplinary rounds um, for all the patients admitted to the neurocritical care unit. Um, so before rounds, I'll work up patients, I'll kind of check orders, I'll pre-round. Um, but throughout the day, I'll really be verifying all medication orders for patients admitted to the neurocritical care unit during my shift. Um, so this, this means any, any medication order that gets put in by a provider will come through me for verif verification before we administer to the patient. Um, additionally, I get a lot of drug information questions from both um, other pharmacists, uh, nursing, physician, advanced practice providers. Um, you know, I can get drug information questions anywhere from you know, how fast do I administer this medication? Can I crush this medication to, you know, what medication should we do next or what antibiotics should we use? Um, so there's a huge variety in the types of drug information um, questions I can get, um, which really makes my job really enjoyable um, and challenging because you never really know what you're going to get and it's going to change from day to day depending on the complexity of the patients. Um, I also participate in many of the interdisciplinary hospital committee meetings as a pharmacist representative. Um, so being the neurocritical care pharmacist, I, um, you know, participate in our comprehensive stroke center um, quality task force, making sure that there's um, plans and procedures in place, as well as protocols and pathways to making sure that if someone is admitted, um, you know, with an ischemic stroke, they are worked up and they have, you know, treatment as soon as possible. Um, in the neurocritical care setting, we often quote time is brain, um, meaning that the, the quicker we can get you access um, to care, the more um, we can salvage any deficits that are occurring. So, um, you know, our goal in the acute setting is always to make sure that we identify any opportunities for improvement in our processes to make sure people get as rapid of care as they can. Um, additionally, being in an academic medical center, um, a lot of what I do involves teaching. Um, so I teach a lot of different um, specialties. I'll teach pharmacists, um, you know, anything new going on in critical care or um, neurology. I'll have pharmacy students that come on rotation with me. Um, so part of being in pharmacy school, you do have to go on clinical rotations. Uh, and with that, you know, they come on rotation with me and I'll kind of teach them, um, you know, how I approach a patient and, and help them develop their clinical skills um, to be a, pharma a clinical pharmacist once they're done graduating. Um, there's also pharmacy residents that come through uh, my unit that I'll also participate in teaching and then, you know, making sure our advanced practice providers, neurology residents, neurocritical care fellows are all up to date in anything um, as it pertains to medications and new medications that come out. Um, a lot of my afternoons are spent uh, developing any hospital specific protocols or medication guidelines. Um, so, you know, there's over 20,000 different drugs that are approved by the, the FDA. We don't have all of those drugs on formulary, um, but certainly many of them we do. And it's important that we kind of have guidelines in place on how to use these medications um, to optimize, you know, safe and effective care. Um, and, you know, there's tons of different, different medication guidelines that, um, you know, I can talk about and protocols that we can talk about. Um, but, you know, that is a huge part of my job is participating in those, um, as well as any quality improvement, medication safety or cost savings initiatives. So, um, you know, I think we all on this call probably know that healthcare is very expensive in the United States and identifying cost savings initiatives is always you know, the goal to make sure that we're able to meet the demands of, um, you know, patients who are admitted to the hospital. And this can range from anywhere of like a simple switch in our product um, from a pre-mixed bag to maybe now we mix it, um, you know, and that could save 200 to $300,000 a year for the same exact medication. So stuff like that, we, we work to identify. Um, 
you know, one of my favorite parts of my job is the opportunity to participate in uh, retrospective and prospective research studies. So um, both retrospective um, studies that I have designed and work with the pharmacy department on, as well as any prospective clinical trials that are coming through um, the neuroscience ICU. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one of my personal interest areas. Uh, one of the unique things about pharmacy is that you can kind of uh, have the flexibility to adjust your schedule to kind of fit your interests. Um, so, you know, beyond multidisciplinary rounds and verifying orders, you know, after that, you're really kind of tailoring your job to what, you know, motivates you the most. If you like teaching students, then maybe you take on more students to teach. If you like doing research, um, maybe you take on less students, and then you'll participate in more research, or you get, you know, students involved in research. Um, the other thing um, that I think is good to know for hospitals is that there is a pharmacist who responds to every rapid response or code within the hospital. So if any patient has an acute decompensation, um, the pharmacist will go and respond with a code response team. Um, and with that, they will help, you know, mix medications, help with medication selection, um, or just, you know, patient assessment and making sure that any follow-up care um, as it pertains to medication is, is, is in place. Um, and then, as I mentioned previously, any medication counseling that is uh, requested, um, I will participate in. Is there any questions pertaining to kind of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis? No questions yet, but I'm sure they'll come in soon. So you can keep going for now. Cool. Um, you know, so I mentioned that, you know, to become a pharmacist, um, you do need to go through a pharmacy um, program and get your doctorate of pharmacy degree. Um, after you finish pharmacy school, um, you do take a licensing exam to be a licensed pharmacist and you also have to take a law exam. Um, but after that, it really depends on what type of um, practice area you're going into. So, you know, if you're going into health system pharmacy, which um, is where I practice in a hospital, um, the requirements are is that you um, participate in a PGY1 pharmacy practice residency. So this is kind of like a general one year residency where you're gonna rotate through a ton of different, ton of different, um, you know, areas of pharmacy. You're gonna look, you're gonna go into like an infectious disease. You're gonna go into the medical intensive care unit, the cardiology unit, uh, emergency departments. You're gonna spend about a month in each of these areas to kind of broaden, um, you know, your clinical skills and get, and get more experience. And then after that, you really get to decide, you know, what do I want to specialize in? Um, so a lot of pharmacists are specialized in specific areas. Um, I'm personally specialized in critical care pharmacy. Um, so after you do that, you can take your, your specialty board exams. Um, the general pharmacotherapy specialist board exam is after your PGY one year. And then after your PGY two year is when you can take your specialty board exams. Um, and then from there is when you start looking for a job to get into clinical practice. So you do pharmacy school, um, you know, one to two years of residency and then clinical practice. Um, you can go into clinical practice after one year of residency, um, but for those specialty areas, such as the intensive care unit, they do, you know, are now requiring you to have a PGY2 specialty residency to kind of show that you have the experience and the foundational knowledge to kind of really integrate into those teams. Um, and there's a lot of different residencies that are available in pharmacy that kind of allow you to find the area that best suits your interests. So just to kind of go over a couple, you know, ambulatory care is really um, focusing on pharmacists going into the clinic setting. Um, so here's where patients will come to the, their primary care office and maybe they might see a pharmacist to help with any medication counseling, um, or they might even uh, have the pharmacist be dose adjusting medications. Um, there's a lot of hypertension clinics, um, hyperlipidemia clinics um, that help address patients' blood pressure medications. Again, pharmacists are one of the most um, accessible healthcare providers. Um, and, you know, most of the time we can't bill for our services um, depending on the state. So, uh, you know, our services are largely free if the institution um, supports the facility to give us, um, you know, the space to have those clinics. So, you know, from a patient's perspective, that's something that is a huge um, benefit to them to be able to, to go and speak with a pharmacist. Um, critical care pharmacy, you know, I'm um, going to be biased because I think this is one of the most interesting areas of critical uh, pharmacy practice. Um, I chose to go into critical care pharmacy based, um, you know, on the complexity of the patient population. Um, you know, critically ill patients are going to have a lot of um, 
uh, differences in their elimination and metabolism and interactions with drug that just aren't present um, in the non-critical care patient population. So medication use in a critical care patient um, is very different than medication use in someone who is, um, you know, home or just admitted to general medicine floor. Um, so I, I like that challenge with critical care pharmacy. Um, the other thing with critical care pharmacy is that every single day it changes. So, um, you know, there's a new challenge every single day, there's variety and each patient every single day, you have to kind of relook at them again and start from scratch. Um, you know, some people might not like that, um, but it's something that I really enjoy that I can really uh, you know, modify therapy as I go. And it's not just, you know, looking at their medication profile once, and then that's it. Um, but I really have to look at it every day to make sure that they're getting the most, um, you know, safe and effective medications for them. Another um, area of pharmacy practice that a lot of people go into is infectious disease pharmacy. So, um, you know, these pharmacists are going to be ones that work with the antimicrobial stewardship teams or the infectious disease doctors and really you know, thinking about the best way we can use antibiotics to one, uh, you know, treat a patient's infection based on whatever um, bug or virus is growing. So you're going to select a specific antibiotic that best treats that um, bug, um, but also making sure that we're not having overly broad antibiotic use. Um, and with that, you know, preventing the development of resistance in the community um, and making sure that the antibiotics that we do have available uh, you know, maintain their efficacy for as long as possible. Um, you know, some areas of the world have issues where they have more resistant um, bugs than other areas. And it's really important to make sure that we're very um, thoughtful in how we select our antibiotics to prevent any resistance from happening. Um, and then I have a bunch of other ones listed there um, that I'm happy to talk in, uh, more about if anyone is interested, but um, kind of critical care pharmacy is my my home. Um, and then, you know, after you do a, a specialty residency, there's a bunch of board certifications that you can get. Um, so I have listed the different types of board certified specialist um, exams that you can take. Um, so as I mentioned, the critical care pharmacy board specialty exam is one of them. There's about 2,700 pharmacists um, currently board certified in critical care. Um, and then, you know, there's um, cardiology pharmacists, or there's about 350 board certified cardiology pharmacists. Um, solid organ transplant is a new specialty that's actually being, um, has been accepted by the um, board of pharmacy special, specialists to have its own designation. So, um, you know, transplant patients have very complex um, medication needs to make sure that they don't reject their organs. So they have um, pharmacists dedicated to making sure um, that patients are on the right medication at the right dose to prevent any rejection of the organ. So they have now kind of recognized that as a pharmacy specialty. Um, so there'll be exams coming for that too, as well as um, emergency medicine. And I think we have a couple questions. Um, yeah, um, a couple. So I'll read one of them that popped up regarding this slide and the last slide. Mm -hmm. um, it asks, could you describe a bit of emergency medicine pharmacy? Yeah, so emergency medicine pharmacy is a really interesting um, specialty. Um, I'm, I'm currently cross-trained in, in emergency medicine, so sometimes staff there. And the role of the emergency medicine pharmacist is very different than the role of an inpatient rounding pharmacist. Um, you know, in emergency medicine, you might not, not have all of the information available. You might not have labs available. Um, and really when they come in, uh, the pharmacist typically goes with the emergency medicine team um, kind of is there for the acute patients, working them up, um, and then they'll help with any, you know, empiric antibiotic selection. Um, they also tend to mix medications um, to help, you know, with um, intubation. So if someone is having trouble breathing and then they need to put in a breathing tube, there's medications that they have to give to be able to facilitate that process. Um, so the emergency medicine pharmacist will help um, determine which intubation medications will be most appropriate for that patient and then also which dose that they'll do and then they'll draw that dose and um, you know give it to the nurse administer. Um, for emergency medicine patients that come in who've had a cardiac arrest they'll participate in acute um, cardiac life support so any medications that are being compounded um, to be administered at the bedside um, to help support um, the resuscitation of that patient they will also help with that um, and then they also do a lot with you know, antimicrobial selection um, for different infections. So 
emergency medicine pharmacists are really cool in that they're, um, you know, kind of, they kind of need to know a little bit about everything because you never know what you're going to get when it comes to emergency medicine. You know, you could get someone who has a infection or you could get someone who has, um, you know, a cardiac problem, or you could get someone who has a neurologic problem and you kind of need to have a baseline knowledge of all of those to be able to support those patients. One more question um, about the same slides, I guess, is how difficult would it be to change specialization? So one of the one of the benefits um, about pharmacy is that it is pretty flexible in terms of um, you know changing specializations. Um, you know, as time goes on and there's more pharmacists who are specialized, it does become a little bit more competitive. Um, but you know, being a critical care pharmacist, um, if I wanted to go work in an emergency department, um, you know, I would be just as qualified to go apply to a job in emergency uh, medicine department. Um, additionally, it's very easy, easy to go from critical care to infectious disease or from critical care to internal medicine um, or, you know, working in ambulatory care clinics. So it's really, you know, dependent on the experience that you gain along the way and kind of your motivation. Um, but just because you work in one area doesn't necessarily mean you can't work in another. Um, currently, I'm you know, specialized in neurocritical care, um, working at Massachusetts General Hospital, but let's say hypothetically, I wanted, you know, to move to a different state and, um, you know, they didn't have a neuro ICU position open, um, but they had a medical intensive care, you know, open, I could easily kind of shift into that specialty. So that's one of the benefits of, I think, pharmacy is that you have a lot of flexibility to go from one um, area to the other. And then you can also always go back and do, you know, a second year residency. I, I have a couple friends who have done um, you know, three residencies to kind of change their specialties along the way. And that's always an option. But once you're within an institution, it's pretty, it's pretty flexible um, when you want to transition from one position to another. Do you want to keep going with your presentation for now? Because there are a lot of questions and not all of them relate to like the past couple slides. Okay. Um, yeah, if you just want to keep um, up to date on some of the questions. If I don't answer them in the next couple slides, then we can talk about them at the end. Sure. Um, so kind of a little bit of background about me and how I ended up as a neurocritical care pharmacist. Um, so I went to a Northeastern University. Um, I graduated in 2015. I did my um, first year pharmacy residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And then I specialized in critical care um, also at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I knew pretty early on that I wanted to specialize in neurocritical care. It was always, um, you know, an area of practice that I felt resonated most with me, um, even as a student and as a PGY1 resident. So I would, you know, kind of go in and um, try and take as many rotations I can in neuro or within the critical care setting so I could really, you know, develop my skills. So I was very fortunate in that when I finished my residency, there was a dedicated uh, neurocritical care um, clinical pharmacist position open um, at the hospital just across town. Um, so I've kind of been there ever since, um, but I could say that this was, you know, the position that I was always striving to work for um, as a residency um, candidate and, you know, here I am. Um, but, you know, there were a lot of twists and turns along the way. Um, so, you know, as a pharmacy student, I kind of looked in a lot of different areas to find what resonated best with me. Um, I knew I wanted to do some form of research. I didn't necessarily know what kind of research I wanted to do. So I did spend some time in the Center for Drug Discovery with uh, bench lab research. Um, didn't really feel that resonated as much with me. I felt like I wasn't as clinical. So then I kind of, um, you know, did an internship in investigational drug services, uh, helping with the order uh, medication distribution when it comes to clinical trials. Um, moved into the community setting, uh, working with patients in the outpatient pharmacy. And then really when I got to the central pharmacy is where I kind of met my mentors um, who were all clinical pharmacists, um, who I felt that, you know, their positions resonated most with me. And I felt like I, that was something that I wanted to do. And, um, you know, at this time is where I was introduced to the neurology pharmacist at Brigham Women's Hospital. And they kind of mentored me along the way from when I was a student. Um, and then I also spent some time interning in the sterile compounding pharmacy. Um, and then, you know, your last year of pharmacy school is really going to be dedicated to clinical rotations. Um, so with that, you kind of rotate through different hospitals. You can um, elect to do certain rotations that interest you the most. Um, so at the time when I started my clinical rotations, um, I was actually most interested in infectious disease. 
Um, so I thought, you know, I was definitely going to try and do a PGY2 and infectious disease. And then I went, um, you know, on my medical intensive care unit rotation at Tufts Medical Center, and I totally shifted gears and decided I wanted to do critical care um, and then kind of settled on neurocritical care. Um, so, you know, one of the great things about pharmacy is that you can kind of go through and try a lot of different um, fields along the way throughout your professional year, years, especially through internships and your advanced practice experiences to really find, you know, what is the best position for you and, you know, what makes you the most happy. Um, you know, one of the questions I saw come up in the chat is what, what do you like most about your job and what do you, what do you not like? Um, you know, one of the things I like most is the patient impact. Uh, you know, being the pharmacist um, for the unit and seeing all the medications that come through, you do have a huge impact on patient care and making sure that patients are getting the most safe and effective medication for them. Um, you know, if there's any changes in their organ function, you know, if you don't reduce the medication appropriately, they could have an adverse side effect from that um, that can really impact their quality of life as well as the care that they receive. So I do feel that pharmacy um, you know, has a really huge impact when it comes to patient care in the hospital. I also really like the variety um, and the challenge, especially in critical care pharmacy. Every, every day is going to be something different. You're going to have a bunch of different patient populations. You're always going to need to stay on your toes. Um, and, you know, every day is a new challenge that you have. And really, I think, you know, pharmacy and any healthcare profession um, is going to be the continuous learning. So anyone who goes into the healthcare profession um, is going to want to like to learn. Um, you know, when I reflect back on my time in pharmacy school, um, you know, I think back to all the medications that I used almost on a daily basis today that actually weren't even approved or available in pharmacy school. Um, so, you know, as new medications get approved, as new clinical trials get published, you really kind of drive, um, you know, your practice as well as the medication utilization based off of new data. Um, so, you know, a lot of what I learned in pharmacy school um, maybe isn't as pertinent today as it was uh, you know, 10 years ago, but it's been really exciting to kind of learn around, learn along the process and really see, you know, how does, how does medicine change and how can we modify our recommendations as new data comes out? You know, as a pharmacist, you're always going to be focused on evidence-based medicine. So, you know, what, what did a trial say that showed that this medication was better than this medication, or maybe this medication had more side effects than this medication? And, and how can you use this data to apply it to your patient population to make sure that they have the best outcome um, that they can? And, and that's one of the really exciting things about um, being a pharmacist. It's also an expanding field. Um, so, you know, looking at the different specialties, you know, even solid organ transplant emergency medicine are now, um, you know, new specialties. And I think, you know, as the value of pharmacists become uh, more widely known and, um, you know, we're more integrated into the hospitals, especially the community hospital setting, um, you know, there's going to be more positions that open up and it's going to be really expanding. Um, I love my team on my unit. The multidisciplinary actions are really, interactions are really something that you know, makes me excited to go to work every day. Um, you know, I, I try to count one day how many different people I talk to. And, you know, it's over 30 or 40 people a day that you're talking to um, all about different, whether it be, you know, professional, clinical, um, challenging cases, or even just personal, um, you know, friends that you make along the way. So for someone who um, is social and really likes to interact with people, you know, clinical pharmacy is great for that. You're going to interact with tons of people every single day. Um, and then there's also a lot of flexibility, I think, with the job. Um, so you can, you can move around if you want to, you know, if you try something, you don't like that position, you can always um, easily, I think, find a job somewhere else. Um, and you can kind of really kind of adjust your position as, as fits best with you. Um, additionally, you know, I think, at least in the hospital setting, um, being able to take vacation has never been an issue for me. Um, you know, the benefits in the hospital setting is that you tend to get more vacation than the community setting or an industry setting. So um, the vacation time is definitely a benefit and then the flexibility to take that vacation. So, um, you know, making sure you have your downtime outside of your job is really nice. Um, and then, you know, job security, um, COVID has impacted the world this past year. And I think, you know, the, the value of healthcare professionals has really been um, highlighted and, and there will always be jobs um, when it comes to pharmacy and when it, especially when it comes to hospital pharmacy. So, um, you know, that, that is one of the other 
things that I like about my job is I can see myself still here in 10 or 15 or 20 years. I don't, I'm not worried about my job going away. Um, you know, some of the things to think about when you're going into healthcare profession is that almost every healthcare profession is going to have some sort of, um, you know, rotating schedule. Um, my position, I rotate through evenings, weekends, holidays. Not every pharmacist job is going to have that, um, especially, you know, some clinical pharmacy specialist jobs in the Midwest or the West Coast. They don't have that. They'll work Monday through Friday. But, um, you know, in the state I work in, um, rotation is just kind of part of the game. Um, not ideal, um, but it is something that you get used to. Um, and then sometimes it, it is it is nice to have, you know, time off during the week to do any errands or anything like that. Um, so if you have, you know, you're working evenings, everyone's at work during the day, it kind of does give you some downtime to focus on you for the week. Um, drug shortages. Um, so, you know, we don't hear too much about drug shortages um, in everyday life, but it is something that really impacts pharmacy um, as well as, you know, um, hospital operations. We've had a bunch of drug shortages, um, whether they be due to natural disasters like hurricanes or, um, uh, you know, even a the swine flu uh, in, that killed all the pigs in China ended up like translating into some crazy drug shortages. So, um, you know, one of those things that's challenging to deal with drug shortages, but it also, you know, can also be exciting to be able to come up with contingency plans and help with the guidelines and making sure that we're using alternative therapies that are just as safe and just as effective. Um, uh, one of the challenges also of pharmacy is that, you know, there is, we're currently in this transition between product-based versus, um, you know, value-based pharmacy. Uh, and, and what that means is that, you know, traditionally pharmacy was kind of linked to how many prescriptions were being filled or how many medications were being dispensed. And we're in this transition kind of as a profession to more of a value-based and like cognitive services-based model to where, you know, we're providing more clinical care. Um, so depending on where you are, you might have, you know, more feeling towards how that product-based um, um, historical perspective has impacted the practice. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that's also being worked on is provider status. Um, so pro pharmacists are not considered providers um, in some states. And with that, that means that we, you know, can't bill for our services. Um, so that kind of limits the amount of staffing support that we get. Um, but many of the states are actually currently in provider status. And um, those that are not do have legislation that have been submitted to get us provider status. So, you know, when we're thinking about the future provider status is something that I think will be kind of, um, you know, countrywide within the next decade. Um, you know, one question that always comes up is what's the, what's the compensation of a salary of a pharmacist? So the median salary is about $126,000 uh, a year. Um, and that's really going to depend on your training. So if you're residency trained, um, that might translate into a higher starting salary. Um, your location, so if you're in a higher cost of living area compared to a lower cost of living area. Uh, your years of experience, um, the field. Um, so, you know, industry pharmacy is going to have the highest, um, you know, salaries compared to like hospital or community pharmacy. Um, and then the shift as well. So they tend to have evening and overnight differentials. Um, but you do reach your, your cap pretty quickly. So, you know, um, a lot of people kind of reach their maximum, um, you know, base salary within like five years of graduation, which the base starting salary is pretty high. Um, but then, you know, after that five years, people tend to start looking for alternative sources of income to try and continue to increase their income as they, you know, progress through life. Um, any questions? Matt, regarding that, do you want to read through any of the questions if you're able to open up the chat? Yeah. Um, okay, so someone had asked if I was ever interested in pre-med and undergrad, um, and if so, how did I decide pre-pharmacy over pre-med? Um, so my older sister is actually a pharmacist. Um, I am one of uh, six kids, and I'm the second oldest, so she went to pharmacy school, and when I was deciding um, between pharmacy school versus uh, pre-med. Um, at the time I was 18, um, I actually went to a 06 program um, that they're kind of retiring out. So I didn't have to take the PCAT. Um, it was like an automatic acceptance into pharmacy school um, for six years. So, um, you know, thinking about pre-med versus pharmacy school, um, I did like, 
you know, the guarantee um, that I would, you know, get into pharmacy school if I maintained my GPA, then I would graduate with my doctorate of pharmacy degree. The job market was really good. The starting salary was really good. Um, and then, you know, thinking kind of about like work-life balance, um, I felt that pharmacy uh, tend to have a little bit better of a work-life balance um, when it came to, you know, once you're done and done with residency. Um, you know, one of the nice things about my job is, um, you know, I'm, you don't necessarily have to take as much home um, compared to some other professions. And, you know, a pharmacist is going to come in when your shift is done and they're going to take over the order verification queue and they're going to kind of handle the floor until you come back the next day. Um, there's going to be projects that you're working on that you, that you, you, um, you know, kind of have on your plate and you have to manage. Um, but for the most part, it does have a pretty nice work-life balance. Um, and then, so um, one of the questions was, would you say that a substantial knowledge in microbiology is necessary for being an effective pharmacist? Um, so that's really going to depend, I think, on the area of pharmacy that you go into. Um, certainly to be an infectious disease pharmacist, you're going to need a substantial knowledge base in microbiology. Um, you know, being a neurocritical care pharmacist, I do need to have, um, you know, some foundational knowledge base in microbiology, especially, you know, if we're treating any um, infections that come through the unit. Um, but for the most part, when it comes to, you know, anti-epileptic drug therapy, um, you know, anti or anticoagulant therapy um, for um, strokes or, or stuff like that, you know, you don't necessarily need to have that um, baseline knowledge, knowledge base. So um, really it kind of depends on the area that you go into, but you definitely need at least some baseline um, knowledge to really be able to manage patients in the clinical setting. Um, let's see. Um, so someone had asked, how do I um, balance my work-life balance and what hours do I work? Um, so my shift every day, um, when I work day shift is 7.30 to 4. Um, so when 4 p.m. hits, um, I'm technically off the clock um, and I can go home. Um, when I work evening shift, it's 2 to 10.30. And then um, I actually, I don't work any overnight shift or anything like that. So um, that's fine. So that's one of the benefits, I think, of pharmacy is you do have a pretty nice work-life balance um, when it comes to kind of your on and off periods. Um, you know, there's always the opportunity to pick up over time if your institution allows, if you're, you know, have the time to work more, if you're interested in, um, you know, making more money. Um, but, you know, one of the nice things about pharmacy is that you do have that, that kind of designated time where you can kind of shut off. So have I ever come across a patient um, with an antibiotic resistant strain of bacteria? Um, yeah, so that's something that's actually um, fairly common in critical care pharmacy. Um, you know, some patients, especially in the medical intensive care unit, um, might have more exposure to antibiotics as they've had chronic illnesses um, and they've required, you know, multiple courses of antibiotics. So, you know, one of the interesting things is those patients are going to have more complex infections and those um, in those cases, it, it really requires, you know, coordination between the infectious disease consult service, um, the pharmacist, as well as the team to make sure that we're optimizing the antibiotic selection and exposure. Um, there's some different strategies that you can do to try and increase penetration of antibiotics. Um, you know, one of the benefits in the NeurICU is that we don't necessarily see as many multidrug resistant infections. Um, largely because most of our patient population doesn't have extensive exposure to antibiotics before they're administered. Um, you know, the more you use antibiotics, the you know, more opportunity uh, there will be to kind of select for a resistant bug. So um, you know, strategies to try and reduce that risk will always be to try and narrow therapy as much as possible. Um, so um, someone brought up a really good question about what is the career outlook for pharmacy with automation progressing? Um, so, you know, that, that's one of the areas of pharmacy that I think is both good and bad. Um, so with increased automation, I think a lot of the operational tasks that we do are going to go away. Um, you know, when it comes to refilling prescriptions, when it comes to, um, you know, dispensing prescriptions or pulling, you know, medications off the shelf to try and send to the floor, I think that's all going to kind of shift to automation. Um, but one of the benefits of that would be that it would really um, 
allow us to kind of focus on more cognitive services. So, you know, one of the things with our job is if, if sometimes I dislike how much operationally focused pharmacists can be, um, and you do wish you had some more time to perform some of the cognitive tasks. And with the increased automation that has really kind of allowed us to perform those tasks. Um, certainly that will kind of make it more challenging uh, when it comes to the job market um, as the, uh, you know, pool of pharmacists, if, if it continues to increase, um, you might have a decreased actual job market because there's less, you know, operational jobs that those pharmacists can fulfill um, when it comes to checking medications and filling prescriptions. Um, what kind, so someone said, what kinds of physicians or nurse practitioners, PAs make your job easier? Um, so I really like those who have a collaborative approach, um, you know, willing to listen to multiple sides, um, interested in learning. Um, so, you know, one of the thing I love about the NPs on my unit is that they're always interested in knowing why I do something a certain way. Um, so kind of internalize that, think about it. And then I kind of see, you know, my recommendations, maybe I don't have to make that recommendation as often um, because I kind of already know which, um, you know, what I'm thinking about when I'm uh, assessing the appropriateness of that medication. So they'll kind of have those questions already in the back of their mind. Um, so those that are kind of engaged, um, you know, interactive, collaborative, um, all, all makes my job easier. Um, and then um, someone asked, could you shadow a pharmacist or how do you get exposed to the field? Um, so a lot of times um, we do have people come in and shadow um, from the community or from high school, from college students. Um, you know, it could be you reach out to the pharmacy uh, manager. If you like Google that pharmacy department for an institution or for a specific pharmacy you're looking at, um, they can, you know, probably uh, connect you with a pharmacist who is practicing in an area that's interested, um, interesting to you. Um, so that's one way that you can shadow a pharmacist and kind of get an idea of what they do in their day-to-day -day life. Um, I have students all the time come and shadow me on the unit um, throughout pharmacy school um, just to get a sense of if, if this is something that they want to do or if they want to go into a different area of pharmacy. Um, any other questions? Um, so there's one question that I don't think you answered. Let me see. Um, what is your perspective on nonprofit pharmaceutical companies? Do you feel they adequately address health disparities and access to medication and lower income patients? Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. I think um, one of the things that gives me hope, <laughs> you know, in this world is how much focus is being placed on trying to address these health disparities. Um, you know, at my institution, we're technically a nonprofit um, institution, and you know, we have certain we have like departments and committees that are trying to address healthcare disparities. Um, you know, when it comes to pharmaceutical companies, um, you know, I think a lot of the disparities are going to you know be within the communities, and I think what we need to do is really kind of go out into the communities and give them the support that they need and. Uh, you know, there are a lot of challenges that we experience when it comes to medication access, um, especially when it comes to higher cost medications. Some of the pharmaceutical companies do have patient assistance programs that decrease the co-pays or increase access for those medications. Um, and with those, you know, they can be a little bit challenging to navigate. They can be a little bit frustrating, but once once you do get those access to those medications, I, I do think it really helps, um, you know, patients. But I do think the system is a little bit broken um, and could be, you know, improved upon in how we get patients access to medications that are higher cost or even, you know, post-hospitalization care. Oops, I was muted. Um, so you have one more minute if you want to answer any more questions. Um, there were a couple that just came in, but it's up to you either way. Yeah, um, I can just go. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I put my email at the end. So I think if there, if you guys have any questions that, um, you know, didn't get answered on this presentation, if you're interested in pharmacy and learning a little bit more, um, feel free to just shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Awesome. Well, thank you for speaking today. Um, yeah, hopefully people will reach out to you. I'm sure they will. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye.